Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. Today's roundtable is very small and intimate. We've got Dude Buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are you? I'm great, Mark. I'm trying to stay warm. Yeah, yeah. It's 80 here, but what's it, 17 in Wisconsin? 17, yeah. It's a little... Uh unseasonably cold right now yeah i i feel for you i feel for you uh we've got i love it when you call me big papa tate litchfield on the mend tate how are you doing well nice weather here in vegas wearing shorts today and a short sleeve t-shirt so uh scott get on a flight come on baby let's go to I vegas know, right? that's right yeah and then last but not least you know him you love him scott todd scott todd.net landmoto.com you're not automating your craigslist and your facebook postings postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek learn anything about anything investor ninjas.com scott todd how are you mark i'm great how are you i'm good i'm great i'm excited about our topic but before we go into our topic and do a deep dive today's podcast is sponsored by flight school Learn more. Get on a call with the Zen Master, Mike Zano, or our very own Scott Bossman, the nightcap OG dude, buddy. Just go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training and see how the next 16 weeks can literally be life changing. Go up that land investing mountain quickly, efficiently, safely with your land geek shirt, your land geek Sherpa, Scott Todd, kicking you up there step by step, as well as all the other land geek coaches. It is a phenomenal program, but you owe it to yourself and your family to learn more. Just go to landgeek.com forward slash training and get on a call. So Scott Todd, what's, what's this week's topic? It seems silly that, w- that we even talk about this, but I get this all the time. And that is sometimes like you may have been sitting on a property for a while, or maybe it's your first property and you have the opportunity to sell it maybe wholesale or sell it to somebody and your profit might be like $300 or maybe it's a property that you bought for 300 and that you can sell it for 600. But is the dollar amount too small to do the deal, right? Like is the dollar amount bad if you're only going to make, let's say $300 on the deal, is that a train wreck? So, I'd like to pose the question to the group. Should, should we even avoid deals that we're going to only make a couple hundred dollars on? Scott, I got a follow-up question to add to that. What's okay. the lowest amount of money you've made or the least amount of money you've made on a deal as well? Okay. All right. That's, we'll add that to the, to the uh, question. All right. Well, Tate, let's just start with you then since you're jumping in. All right. All right. So, uh, the least amount of profit I've made on a deal was, I think it was about $150. Um, I bought a property, it was on a Monday, and I flipped it on like a Wednesday. It wasn't great money, but um, you know, it paid for my mailings, it allowed me to go back and buy more of them, and I sold to a trusted uh, colleague who ended up buying more and more properties from me, so it was a good deal. So I guess to answer Scott's question, no, I don't see any problem with it. And it's something that I think a lot of people get hung up on. They buy a property and they know it's worth maybe $2,000 and they just can't bear the thought of selling it for 100% profit. And it's silly because I'm in the business of selling land and making money. And if I can buy something and flip it and make 100% on my money or make a couple hundred dollars, I'm going to do it all day long because it makes sense. I keep the money moving. This business is about velocity and the person who can sell the most properties, the quickest is going to win. That's my opinion. Yeah. And money loves speed for sure. But 150 bucks Tate, like that can't be worth your time, right? Like, no, that's what someone might say. It probably wasn't worth my time, but what they're, they're not realizing is, it wasn't the only property that I sold, right? And I forged a relationship with this other guy who ended up selling that property for, for close to retail. And he came back to me and said, if you have any more of those, I'd be interested in picking up some additional lots. 
So I did some mailing, ended up buying 10 more of them and flipped them to them again, made my $150 on each lot and turned a hundred and, you know, made basically $1,500 profit. Now that one was worth my time. That was worth my, the energy that I put into it. But on the smaller deal, I was able to roll that money back into the business, buy some more property, reinvest it. And yeah, it wasn't a huge prof profit. I don't do them every day at that, at that price point. But, um, you know, the way I view it is I made money that day. And I made money by flipping property very, very quickly and easily. So it was no sweat. Why wouldn't I do it? Yeah, I mean, Scott, would you do it? Which Scott? Scott Todd? <laughs> would I do it? Well, yeah, your Tate? Or would you have held on for dear life? I wouldn't have held on for dear life. That's for sure. Everything Scott has is for sale. I know this. I've called him before and it's like, He's, he's in the business of selling land too. I've made some ridiculous offers on his property and I know he's not making a ton of money on him, but he always is willing to work with me. So I think I know his answer. Well, how about you, Scott Bossman? What, what are your thoughts on this? Is it worth it? You only make a couple hundred bucks? All right, I'll go with Tate's uh, question first. So <clears throat> the least amount of money I made on a deal was probably 100 150 bucks like you Tate I I bought a property early on uh it was in a subdivision that I had bought and sold other properties successfully and it just so happened that one street over the road was impassable and I purchased basically a slab of rock so I didn't do the best I didn't have I didn't get boots on the ground right these subdivisions we work in they're so cookie cutter that you know, every once in a while, the street over, maybe things will be a little bit different. While it ended up being a little bit different, it was very difficult to get to the property. Uh, so after uh, sitting on it for quite a while and getting frustrated, I kind of, uh, I packaged it with another deal about three miles away and basically said, buy this lot, get this one free, and just kind of packaged it in the deal and came out ahead maybe 100, 150 bucks, something like that. Um, but uh, so there are creative ways to, you know, if you're sitting on a property that you're having a hard time getting rid of, there are some creative things that you can do with marketing, you know, throw it in a package deal, um, move it that way, finance it for 50 bucks a month over time, you make some, you make some money. But, uh, you know, I agree with you. I think uh, money loves speed. It's all about velocity in this business. And, uh, you know, if you, if you buy a property and you're having a hard time moving it and, and you're getting burnt out on the thing and it just like you cringe every time you see it, why not, why not sell it for a couple hundred bucks and move on and just redeploy that money in your business? Um, sometimes, sometimes that's the best thing to do is wash your hands of it and move forward. Yeah, really good point. Really good point. Scott Todd, how about you? Well, probably the lowest dollar amount I've made on a property is I probably made about $200 profit on a property. And on that particular one, what happened was I bought it um, in an area that I thought would sell well. And it, eventually that area did start to sell well, but I got a little panicky and I decided to take it to eBay. And uh, I saw other people selling these properties for like, let's say $4,000 on eBay. And I was into it for 200, I'm sorry, 2000. I was into it for 2000. I thought, well, that wouldn't be too bad. So I put, I put a minimum up there of $2,000, which would cover my cost or plus, plus another hundred for the eBay fees, whatever. And the property actually sold for 24, uh, 2300 yeah 2300 but then I also charged a dock fee of 495 so technically I made a little bit more than that even though I didn't count the dock fee into the profit uh, so I probably made about $200 on the property so I mean it wasn't a terrible deal and it's, but it's not necessarily one that we like to like really talk about but I agree that you see a lot of times what happens is people make decisions about properties or whether they should sell or not uh, especially when it comes to like wholesale on a property because they're like, oh, it's only $200. Well, $200 is not about the $200. Okay. The $200, I, 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 I look, I, I hear you. It may not be something that moves the needle, but man, 
if you could do $200 a week of just profit on a deal, well, that's 800 a month. What does 800 a month do for somebody's lifestyle, right? You see, we always think about like passive income. Oh, I got my passive income to whatever. Well, if you can sell a property every week with consistency and make 200 bucks of profit, well, you could use that to pay expenses. You could use that to pay your mailing costs, uh, your cost of your, you know, running your business, your overhead. And in fact, there's an area that I work in that we routinely sell, you know, I, we call them singles. We routinely sell these singles. And, you know, we, we, we probably make about, when, when everything is said and done with, profit is probably about 350 bucks and we sell about two of them a week, okay? So that's 700 a week, you know, $2,800 a month. That, look, that's a lot of money, okay? Like it, it adds up. So if you can find these things, don't be ashamed to sell sometimes lower end properties. But you know, like I was looking at um, at a land um, land land business website the other day, and they love to show their their success stories. And they were showing, oh, I made twenty thousand dollars on this property, and I made eighteen thousand dollars on this property. Well, those things happen, but in my experience, they don't happen with enough frequency in this business that you're going to profit out at a twenty thousand dollar cash sale right off the bat. And they're showing the checks. That's like getting lightning to strike, okay? Like in, this, in my experience. So, you know, I think you have to kind of be careful with sometimes your expectations. Think, think about what the money can do if it adds up or if it's repeatable over time. Because Mark, if you can sell two properties a week and you're making 350 a property and generating 700 a week and you can do it consistently, even though it's not passive income, I would beg to differ that it is passive income, right? It's passive profit because you know you can do it every single week. Yeah, especially if you're using like LG Pass or Geek Pay, um, you've got VAs, you've got systems. There's nothing wrong with a system of, of a $200 profit a day or a week. Right. Because that's really not that passive. I mean, if you look at your effective hourly rate and it took you 15 minutes of time to close that deal, talking with the person, you know, with LG Pass, paperwork takes what, a minute, 30 seconds? Less than. Fast as you can refresh it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'd love, uh, I'd love, you know, sometimes, you know, you talk to somebody, they're like, oh, you know, it's only $200 or $300. Um, it's not really worth it. Well, let's reverse it. And let's say that you had to invest $100,000 to make $10,000. Well, you'd be like, oh, $10,000 is way better than $300. But if I could invest $300 to make $300, my risk is so much lower. I'm staying in the game literally forever. I'll never get knocked out of that game. Where how many times, how many $100,000 deals can someone realistically do? So to Scott's point, yeah, if you, if you flipped a piece of property, you made a $20,000 profit, I don't care about your profit. I want to know what was your return? Because if you invested $200,000 and you got back to $220,000, well, I'm not that impressed on that. Oh, and what's the time? How long did it take you to do that too? And the time. So it's not telling the whole story. Um, now, if you invested $100,000 and you made $200, yeah, not great. Um, not a great deal at all. But if you're buying it for 200 and you're flipping it for 400, 600, okay. And you continually do that and you've got the velocity. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with it personally. Um, Mark, I was going to say that like the other thing too, is that sometimes the worst return that you can get that in my experience, the worst returns I'll get are, are on the, the larger properties, right? You know, like, you buy a property for like, we bought a property for, um, we bought 330 acres in uh, Northern Nevada. Sounds, sounds like a dream, right? You know, we paid $30,000. It's a bargain. I loved it. Okay. But to find a, a buyer for that thing. Okay. 
that that buyer is not our typical buyer. Like that buyer is not the same type of buyer. And it took us, uh, I don't know, we just sold it. I think we bought it. I think we bought it about a year and a half ago. We just, okay, about, I guess about eight months ago. And we just sold it. And look, we sold it for $88,000 and the guy's going to pay it off in 12 months. So that's not a bad deal. But when you look at the, the time to sell on these bigger properties, it's not as good as the, um, you know, like the smaller properties that will sell faster, in my opinion. I'd rather get the cash flow going immediately. No, it, absolutely. It's all about cash flow and in moving that money. Nobody wants that money sitting. And I think if, if you're looking at this and like, oh, you know, if I can only make $200 on a deal um, and you're, you're missing the, really the big picture. Uh, you know what a, a billion dollar company is? The dollar store. <laughs> They're buying this stuff for 20, 30 cents and they sell it for a dollar. They're just doing big volume. Now think about their overhead. They've got to buy the land. They've got to build the building. They've got to have employees. And they've got to be buying constantly to stock those shelves. How many of those things they need to sell for a buck? But they're doing it. Is that a bad business? Would someone look at it like I only made 70 cents? Hey, Mark, no. there, I was over the weekend. I was, I was uh, home not feeling well. I was crashing on the couch, start YouTubing stuff. I don't know how I got into this, this thing, but it just pops up and it's like, um, this guy's going to, to this guy and his wife, they go and they're playing the retail arbitrage game, right? So like their his specialty was shoes. So he's showing like, okay, I'm going to go. He maps out a day of going to Ross locations, the Ross store locations. And he's looking for shoes that he can flip and sell on eBay. So, He's going out there and he's finding these shoes and he's showing you like, okay, let's, let's punch in this code into the eBay app. Let's see what the sales of the shoes are. Okay, well, this pair of shoes is $17 and it's selling on eBay for $40. $20, I'm in. Okay, so he's buying these shoes where he's going to make $20 on it, right? And it, it was kind of addicting to watch because... He, he, you know, like he's like shot, he, it's almost like a treasure hunt. Okay. Like he's going hunting for, for shoes. At the end of the day, he put in like 10 hours of driving around to all these raw stores, 10 hours. I think he bought like, um, I think he bought like 30 pairs of shoes. I think he spent like $500 on shoes, something like that. And he was estimating that he was going to sell them and make about five or $600 on the shoes. Okay. So think of like, I think about this and I'm like, man, this guy is driving around town for 10 hours to go make $500. Well, man, I could easily buy a piece of property and sell that thing. Even if I wholesale it and make $500, you can pay for whatever you want without having to go driving around to every Marshall's or Ross that there is looking for a pair of shoes that you may get stuck with. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the nice thing about this is these are kind of anomaly deals. It's, it's not that this happens every day. We only make two or $300. You throw in the recording fee, you know, we'll pick on Eric Peterson of only 250. Now you're making, you know, 450, uh, 550 on a deal. And you, you use that capital and, 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 you know, make your 300 to 1,000% on the next one. Just keep that money moving. Tate, what were you going to say? And, well, I was also going to say, we got to remind people that this isn't the only piece of property that you're selling either, right? This is one of a dozen. So, yeah, you might sell it for $200 profit. Okay, good job. Not a bad day of work. But at the same point, you might have six other properties out there that you're marketing, that you're getting leads on, that are going to generate you, you know, $1,500 in passive income. So if you can free up some cash and then redeploy it to get properties that are more in demand, you should do it. Absolutely. And one of the things Scott talked about that's, that rings true to me is that mental fatigue, right? We all have, you know, a list that we look at to see what of our property is still for sale. And 
every single person has one lot on there that it's just a, it just makes you cringe every time you look at it or it defaults and you're like, no, it's back. I hate this property. And sometimes I look at it and I think if I could just get rid of this and break even on it and not ever have to look at that APN again, I would be happy. It would be worth it to me. So there's value there. I mean, maybe it's, it's certainly more than $200 if it gets to that point. So it's not that this is just the only way you can sell land. Hopefully you've got a lot for sale and you bought a dud or something that somebody values significantly lower than you do. Okay, sell it, move on, learn from it, take that data and, and roll it into something better. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Boston, final thoughts? No, I just think, uh... I think so many of us, uh, you know, we hear the we hear the rock star stories, and we're maybe afraid to get an F on the Land Geek report card. That's not the case, right? As long as you're as long as you're moving forward and you're able to make a couple hundred bucks on a deal, you, the, the, what the bottom line is, you're moving forward, and you know you might might only make a couple hundred bucks on the deal, but um, there are a lot of people, myself included, who had a job that you know it took me four or five hours of painstaking work to make two hundred dollars. Now, if you're, uh, if you're at home, you know, uh, and you're spending, you know, in total an hour or two on this deal and you're making a couple hundred dollars, you're still coming out ahead uh, for a lot of us when we're first starting out. So I, I would say, don't be afraid to, to move it, especially if you're feeling that fatigue and with every sale, especially when you're a beginner, uh, it, it motivates you to do the next sale. So you, you prove to yourself that, hey, I never thought I'd be able to get rid of that property. Look, I got rid of that property. I made 200 bucks and now I'm going to do it again. So proof of concept helps too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's people out there literally risking their lives, Mike Zeno, going into a fiery building. And look, it's noble. It's wonderful that someone, we need someone to do it. But at some point, you let those young guys do it, right? And, and, you know, you go into something like this that you shuffle paper and you make money. The worst thing that's going to happen to you is you not get a paper cut. And that's if you're not using a simple file county. But if you're using a simple file county, there's literally no pain. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, think about, you know, what was that, that show, Dirty Jobs? Oh, I love yeah. that show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean this is like the easiest thing ever and low risk and no one's getting hurt doing it either, either way. <laughs> yeah. I, I gotta tell you, man, like it, it's, it's crazy when you see what people are out there doing for money. I mean, I, I got like a crash course on uh, what people are doing for money over the weekend, just from YouTube. And I, I'm looking at like, man, I, it, it seems cool. So many things seem cool, but I'm like, they're not, it's not worth it to me. You know, like I'm, I'm watching one guy, he's, he bought a, um, he bought a, a coin laundry mat. So he's like showing, and this is very addicting, by the way, he's showing, he's videotaping that he goes into the laundry mat and collects all the money. So if you can imagine, he's opening up, he's, he's going to each machine and dumping the coins in this big thing. And it's like, that looks like the coolest thing ever. It's like watching like a Vegas slots, like dumping out all this cash. And he goes and he collects it. And he's like, okay, well, my, my uh, week's take is uh, like $500, $600. And I'm like, hold on, man. That doesn't sound like it's worth it. You got to drive there. You got to deal with all the maintenance of the laundry equipment. You got to probably going to get mugged after you're showing everybody how much money you make on YouTube. It's just a matter of time, you know, that they're staking you out. And then he shows for one month, he shows like the P and L and you know, the, the P and L on this thing is like a train wreck. You know, it's, it's like the profit on the whole thing is like, uh, I think his profit after, after all expenses and everything was only like 800 bucks for the month. He's got to deal with customer service. He's like, oh, I got to send them checks when the machine takes their money. I'm like, that sounds like a miserable mess, even though it's fun to watch him collect the cash. So it, I think it really all just depends on what, what you're trying to do. But man, there's a lot of easy ways to make cash. And like I said, if I can sell a property with routine for a couple hundred bucks a week and do it regularly, 
it's it's like it's like money to pay your mortgage. Yeah, absolutely. Tate, final final words, final thoughts? Nah, don't be a yield snob. Ah, I don't yield be a profit. <laughs> <laughs> Just, don't be a yield snob. I think we've got a title for our, our podcast. Don't be make a yield the money. snob. Make the money. Be happy. Realize that if you're making a profit, you're on the right track. The unicorn deals are out there, but the only way you're going to find them is if you're constantly doing the basic things, right? Stick to the bread and butter deals. I can, I know I speak for, for Mark, but I'm pretty sure Scott and Scott will agree with me. The bread and butter deals are almost more exciting than the big ones, right? Because you just know like, oh, $150 a month. I love getting paid $150 at a time. Doesn't sound like much to many people, but for me, I've built a lifestyle around $150 a month payments and I wouldn't trade it for any, any other thing out there because this is safe. It's safe. What I do is safe. It's consistent. It's predictable. And if you follow the land geek method, that's what we teach you, right? We teach you how to build a business that is steady, consistent without surprises. Yeah. I mean, the longer you do this, the better things go. I mean, you know, we, we know a guy in his seventies has been doing this. He's like a, he's like the OG in land. This guy's got what, 4,000 notes. Yeah. Four, you told me the other day, yes. 4,000 notes. And, uh, this guy's running, like he's running a big business. Right. And, uh, the, the potential in this business is incredible. And by the way, he's in one County in one county and his, his notes aren't that big. They're not, man. I think, I don't know the exact average, but it's not, it's not huge notes, okay? They're not huge notes. Right. So the moral of the story is this is, we're playing the long-term game here. This is not get, you know, wealthy fast. This is get wealthy slow. And again, if you're like a Roberto Chavez, it's not even that slow. What was it, 13 months? He, was it 15,000 a month in passive? Just depends. I mean, you know, who cares how long it takes? I mean, Once your you passive add, income exceeds yeah. your fixed expenses, does it matter? Here's the thing. If you can add, say, $500 a month in passive income, I mean, that is, that is amazing, right? At the end of the year, you've got a passive income of six grand. Two years into this, 12, three, four, I mean, if it took you four years to replace your day job and then have total freedom, isn't it worth it? I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's a silly question to ask because of course it's worth it. So you don't have to, you know, quit your job in six months in order to be successful here. Take it slow. Like you said, it's a get rich, slow program. And if you just stick to the basics, it can happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads us to our tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. Oh, what is it, Eric? Mimi? Our tip of the week people aren't even on the call. So we're gonna ask you, dear listener, to go to the Land Geek official uh, wealth creation and motivation page on Facebook leave a comment saying we want Mimi and her tips back or Eric in the tip of the week back. We'll take Jot Not Pro from Eric at this point. Whatever you want to leave as a comment, please do. We got to motivate them to come back on the round table just the tips of the week, the T-O-W. So please do that. That is, a, that is probably the best tip of the week ever, Mark. It really is. We, we've got to, you know, get the community rallied around the fact that the four of us are not, we've just, spoiled, we're spoiled now. We're not going to research the way those two do for the tip of the week. We're waving the I mean, white flag. Tag them, tag them, tag them in your yeah, comment. Yeah, tag them. Because that will, that like, they'll be, they'll like be crying for mercy. Please stop tagging me. Yeah, please do it. Um, also, Give us three little favors if you're getting value from these podcasts. You got to subscribe. You got to rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free 
the $97 passive income launch kit, as well as the cherry on top, the new wholesaling course, how to double your money 30 days or less. So please do that. Um, Scott Bossman, any announcements? No, we got, well, we got, we got uh, something exciting coming up uh, on the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Zeno and I are holding our uh, second annual Land Geek Lounge event. So last, last year was kind of cool. We sat in a room for like three hours, sat in a Zoom room and had 30 or 40 people come in and ask questions about land investing. And we didn't know we'd had that many people the night before Thanksgiving, but we had a lot of people interested. So it was our chance to reach out to people and just educate them about the business. And it was a lot of fun. So uh, the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, my mouse isn't working. I'd show you what the date is, but I, I can't get uh, I know the date. 27. The 27. Yeah. 27. So that's from uh, 7 p.m. Eastern to 10 p.m. Eastern. We'll All right, mark info. your calendars. And it's yeah. not like Nightcap where you have to have a cocktail. It's no. nice if you want to have a cocktail, but it's not mandatory, right? Correct. It's not mandatory. All right. We're, Fantastic. When's the next Nightcap? Next Nightcap is, uh, well, we've moved to every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so tomorrow night, the 13th, uh, we'll be on. And then the 20th, I think Mike's working. So we'll be off here for, for a week or so. All right. Check the Facebook group for those announcements. Um, thanks, everybody. One, two, three. Let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Uh, you know. That was pretty good not bad four of us can't can't complain i think we could be a little bit more coordinated with just four of us maybe we should maybe we should record this thing like uh when we're all together and then we just yeah the yeah that'd be a good idea and then now it's we're getting geeky perfect but we won't tell yeah. anybody we did that no no we'll we lip, won't say a word we'll put ourselves on mute we can still lip sync it for the video it'll be perfect Jeez. No one will ever know. I like it. I, re I really like it. For sure. It's a good idea. Hey, have you so, gone to, uh, to, have you gone to Cheesecake Factory or Panera Bread this week? Me? Grigio. No. You know, I did, um, I did uh, have some cheesecake uh, delivered to the house via Uber Eats from Cheesecake Factory. So, oh. yes, nice. I guess I... You know, I don't have this beef with cheesecake. It's just so loud in there that I don't like eating there. Their food's oh, actually pretty good. No problem. And their cheesecake, I mean, that's, talk about getting a home run with the missus. Hey, what's at the door? Oh, it's your favorite <laughs> cheesecake. Who would have sent that over? Yours truly. Oh. What if she would have said, like, Mark? What? Well, Mark sent stuff to my room before. I don't think that we can't discuss that on this podcast before. When, when Karate Ninja chopped that employee at the hotel. Yeah. Mark learned a very valuable lesson that night that sending really nice brownie desserts to people's hotel rooms at 1130 at night isn't always well received. Didn't you, Mark? I really did. Um, I haven't done it since. So I've learned my lesson. <laughs> oh, for sure. seriously the the greatest story ever we got to share that at boot camp sometime yeah i think uh i'm gonna do something more creative but you know sugaring people up is is sort of one of my favorite things to do yeah it's your specialty for sure you're really, really good is. at it like although i have been trying to cut back on sugar in the past two three weeks and uh i feel pretty good that's going to be hard coming up on the holidays. Well, that's why I'm doing it. So I can just guilt free, literally mm. just try, you know, death by, you know, pumpkin pie, something like that. Good way to know. go. Is, is, yeah, what, what, <laughs> there's worse ways to go for sure. Yeah. So, you know, my question is though, speaking of Thanksgiving of the food, which is your favorite? Is it this Turkey? the potatoes, the stuffing, then you got the cranberry thing going on, and then you got the desserts. Like if you had sweet to choose potatoes. just one of those, the sweet potatoes, with like the marshmallow stuff on top. We make twice um, baked sweet potatoes. 
They're amazing. That's decadent. Sounds good. I'm going to say turkey. The turkey? We deep fry it. Yeah, we deep fry a turkey. So it comes out so delicious and moist. It is, uh, and it takes so long and you're just out there in the sun, right? It's like 75 degrees outside and you're just basking in the aroma of deep fried turkey smoke. It's, it's amazing. So yeah, turkey for me. That's Scott. Um, uh, not so much the turkey, more of like the mashed potatoes or the like the sides, you know, mashed potatoes, like the green beans, um, sweet potatoes, anything that, that has like anything that's bad for you, like high carb, probably that's my go to. And then nothing like jumping right into the desserts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I really try to be surgical about it as far as the energy so not too much turkey because it's going to make me tired and i really want to save all that energy to uh what, to get that what's wrong sugar with getting tired and then and then crash from the sugar yeah not yeah. the turkey the other pro the other problem it's not really a problem but the other issue i have is like you know we'll have like thanksgiving lunch and i will tend to eat a lot at the lunch i mean you know that's what you do right but then for some reason, my wife doesn't like eat a lot. So, you know, like there'll be food all around and we'll get home and she'll be like, I'm really starving. I'm like, I'm about to puke. I'm so full. How, how are you starving? And she's like, well, I didn't really eat too much because I was talking all day. And I'm like, let's talk more food, man. So then she's like, oh, what are we going to eat? I'm like, I can't even think about eating. Seriously, I'm going to die right now so it's kind of like this uh, thing i gotta this year i gotta do a better job of preparing for a, a second meal later on yeah yeah by the way is it poor is it is it poor thanksgiving etiquette not to completely stuff yourself like if you're not kind of like unbuttoning your pants at some point in the night like is it it's just is it is that just sort of a, a thanksgiving foul it might be un-american is it un-american yeah it might be definitely un-american yeah you should eat till it hurts. Is that, that's, that's like <laughs> tradition, right? Yeah, I, I think that's just kind of standard protocol, right? Yeah, because if you're, if you're the cook and you're hosting it and everyone's sort of not eating their fair share, mm. do you feel offended? Yeah. I don't know. It's a dangerous Good holiday question. in that sense. It's a dangerous holiday. It's, it's a philosophical question, isn't it? How, how much is enough? I've, I get a little upset when I make a, a meal and like people don't eat it. Like, so if I was making a huge feast for Thanksgiving and people didn't eat it, I think, I think it'd be my feelings would be hurt a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I get it. I yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's being polite, right? Yeah. Not cool, man. Not cool. Not cool. All right, so we're all agreed. All right. Well, speaking of, I'm going to go eat some lunch. Uh, leftover turkey chili. I'm very excited about it. Nice. High protein. Nice. Yeah, that's nice. All right, see you guys. All right, see you guys. See ya.